the strange affair over these last 18 years. Yeah. And during that time, of course, uh, these guys have moved into this factory. So I've actually only been here when this was a shell. So I've not been on this site, um, really, as it is now, ever. So I'm, I'm a little bit at sea the same as you. Um, <laughs> it's all out of the <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, if, I'm quite looking forward to going to the shop because I need it. There won't be anything left. Really, it's just something completely oh, yeah. gutted, isn't it? Yeah, I haven't got yeah, to the toy yet, but I'll hang on to this. Just yeah. To see. yeah, it was painful. Because that was lockdown. Yeah. You get through all your backlog of things that have been in the cupboard for several years that you haven't touched. Oh, I wish I could say the same. I've got, I've, I've, oh, well, I'm sure you, you have. Yeah. I, I don't know about you, but has anyone here developed a bit of an eBay habit? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it seems to have grown. Yeah, <laughs> uh, things keep uh, turning up. Uh, those those uh, are delivering them in the, the, the phrase in the briefing. I see the cats have been on the internet again. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I've been, I know this is kind of perverse and nothing to do with models really, but I've been revisiting the 1970s. Uh, well, I like I like the 1970s in many ways. The music was great. I hair. Uh, <laughs> 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 so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, and I, um, uh, I've been putting together or refurbishing armies that I had when I was a teenager. Uh, mostly minifigs and um, uh, uh, Little Hitchcliffe, Billy Garrison, that sort of thing, which will mean something to those similar age to me, and probably nothing to those of you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I've been doing that, that a bit, and the only, the only kind of modern thing I've been playing is, um, and saying modern, so is what? Is Black Powder. Yeah. Which Alessia and I have been taking part in. But we took part in a big campaign that stopped, that stopped <laughs> when it started Covid, and then had a hiatus for almost 18 months, and then picked up again. And we finished that, and most of the Perry wins. Yeah. The American Civil War one. Yeah. There was this battle. This great victory for the Union, do you remember? No, I forget. I forget. <laughs> <laughs> well, talking about Black Power, are you ever going to do an 1813 book? <laughs> I don't know. What for? What for? That's Leipzig. Mm. Late, late. Do you know, I, I, I don't know. You'd have to ask the some good studio guys. Um, when we play Black Panther, we tend to be very vanilla with it, don't we? Well, particularly the penalties. Yeah. yeah. Every time you play, the rules are different. <laughs> <laughs> they wing it, wing it a lot. And if there's something they think is appropriate for that game or for that series of games, we'll play that. We'll just say, oh, for this series of games, we're going to play whatever. The range is now old, the ball is hard. It's like, well, <laughs> they did the Civil War, the cavalry couldn't close on the infantry. Right. We're not allowed to close the infantry unless the infantry was disordered and then yeah. the tested and all that sort of thing. From the read area, there was some clauses there. Yeah. There was some debate went on during the game itself. It makes the game more interesting. But we always played with an umpire. I don't know about you guys. I mean, do you, how many people here regularly play with an umpire as a third player? Good now. Yeah. <laughs> as long as it's not me, I'd rather play with an umpire. Ah, you know, I, don't like like some player, I, don't I quite so. enjoy being umpires. You have to be a bit wary of favouritism. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. <laughs> They're always picking on me, eyes. Yes. Well, they, uh, we always do, don't we? We always have an umpire. Although I wouldn't call them impartial. No, 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 I mean, Alan Perry is often being umpire, which is his house. It's, 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 it's your house, you have to be umpire. That's the rule, isn't it? It's funny. I remember when they made a, a chart to, to see where where anybody was shot. You just roll two to six on this chart and see where, where you're followed with the general and it was important where, where you were hit. And, and we kept rolling these two to six and going, Groins! Hit the groins! He's <laughs> <laughs> groins on this number seven by any chance. <laughs> yes, why? Let me explain about this belt. It's usually the idea of the rules. <laughs> Is <laughs> on the seven? Yes. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we've had some fun with that, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. The latest one's been Paraguayan War, but uh, I'm not sure you can make that. No, no. my back was not yeah. back. Ale Alessio was uh, laid up. Oh, in fact, he's so abnormal at all. <laughs> Freakish. <laughs> yeah. yeah, developed a... Um, Oh, it's a slip disc or a slip disc, yeah, yeah. keeping this nice and on top. Yeah, great. 
very healthy. Yes. Yes. Um, so, how many of those games did you actually play via a um, Zoom link? Only one. It really doesn't work. I mean, we did try. We did try the. You know, the, we were disembodied faces on a, on, a, on a phone on a on an arm. Yeah. Can't see. Can't hear. They can't hear you. It's just that we. we well, what does work, I found, and I really enjoyed, was playing bolt action on uh, Tabletop Simulator. Mm -hmm. Anybody mm -hmm. tried that in, yeah. the, in the lockdown? Mm -hmm. So I found that basically, is, I don't know if you're trying it. No, I, 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 I you know, and if, any, anything that involves computer with moving images on it, I'm a bit wet, you know. <laughs> yes, it would make me sick. It would make me sick, yeah. 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 But basically, it's a virtual table with virtual armies, uh, you, like your camera can Go around, zoom in, out. Start to feel queasy. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> an artificial environment to play the game, though. and uh, it was much better than I expected. It was literally, I thought it was going to be clunky, uh, but now actually felt really good. And so, sort of obviously, we are thinking, could we actually make something on this platform officially with the world and stuff? So, we were talking about it. But yeah, monetizing there is the difficult part. Isn't it? Yeah. How do you get, you know, you sell stuff? You, some membership, so, so yeah, it, we're talking about it. it could be. And, and the debate is always whether these things mean you sell less physical product or not. From what we hear is actually the other way around because more people get to try it and they go, Oh, I wish I could play this, you know, yeah. in real things. So it's more, almost like marketing. So, yeah, it's been debated whether it's worth it or not. Yeah, interesting. Actually, I've not played Bolt Action for a bit. And in fact, the last time you and I played World Fashion, which is around my place, you played with the second edition rules and I played with the first edition rules. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when we play at the ferries, isn't it? It would, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Black Panther on the ferries go, I think it works on this, so I'm reading the rules. But I it's like, what, what book are you holding? Uh, I don't know, what about you? We are using different rule books. <laughs> 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 It's a great testament to the strength of the rule writing. <laughs> <laughs> a whole one. <laughs> yes. I was just going to say where I've been doing a little bit of on, online with some friends around the country, yeah. uh, but more for things like role play games, uh, and okay. that you could because you're playing it in your head rather than anywhere else. That works really well. We've yeah. had some very good fun games with that. But uh, when it comes to uh, tabletop. Nah. You, you gotta have them in. You gotta be God standing over it, it's looking like, down. It's a tactile thing, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it is. You really do need to be there. Um, yeah. Uh, for the beer, just give me think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it is right. Yeah, um, um, Guy Bowers is the editor of um, uh, Wargame Social Strategy. Who, uh, I don't know if he's here today. Sometimes he, he lives in Devon, I think. It's a good way for he, he runs a role playing group and he invited me to um, take part in it. A bit of short or something, but, mm. but um, what you didn't realize is that you have not played a role playing game for sure, yeah, yeah, those decades, years. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, which is odd, really, because I've written a few role playing games in my time, so you'd think I'd really take interest, but I think writing them is not out the system in play, yeah. yeah we've uh, oh, they've done a revamp of Traveller, oh, uh, yeah, back, yeah. From, back from our days, and it works extremely well, especially in, in the online yeah. environment, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a funny thing. Uh, tra uh, you, Traveller, in my mind, is always associated with the early days of Games Workshop. We did those 15 millimeter figures of Traveller. Mm -hmm. And they were in a box. And yeah. so, well, we had that box designed for those figures. Yeah. But then we used that box for everything. Mm -hmm. So that box was always referred to as the Traveller box. <laughs> so yeah. all the people who come into the company who have never seen, we'd stopped doing Traveller years ago. Mm -hmm. And they say, go and get a Traveller box. What? What's a Traveller box? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the back. Mm. Yeah, I've had to stand. Trust me, it's small. Yes, yes, that's very funny. Yes, it's quite weird. Is is there a period of history or a theme for a game um, that you've never made a game for that you would like to? Uh, it, there's one thing I used to play a lot when I was a kid, and we we really were into it, and I never had a chance to actually do it. Uh, and I, I did actually write a set of rules for this. When I did the first road trader game, mm. but then subsequently I never got the chance to do it, and that's a spaceship game, uh, you know, space combat based game. Mm. Um, when we did Battlefleet Gothic, I kind of crawled up the greasy pole a bit, and we had a, I was in a management role really, 
And I could take, I could cherry pick project if I wanted, but it seemed. I remember being a young games designer and not getting a chance to do things mm. because my boss would say, "Oh, do this, do that, you know, and tell me how to do it sometimes." And so I, I came up with a broad brief back then when Andy Chambers did it because he hadn't designed game back then, so it was his thought it was a good opportunity for him to do it. Mm. So the one damn thing I wanted to do, <laughs> he didn't get to. <laughs> I handed over. Good. Yeah. Um, well, that's the only thing really, apart from that. I mean, I, my war game roots are in. I suppose, I suppose the deep ones with World War Two, but that's because you know it was growing up as a kid in the sixties. Mm. World War Two was bit, and we all pretty much started playing World War Two games. Probably yeah, fix rules. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> before the yeah, Charles Grant. Oh yeah, Charles Grant. Charles, Charles Grant's uh, battle pack. Mm -hmm. And then some of us, um, Donald Featherston. You know, it was, yeah. there was that. We were that kind. Of, we are the Andy Pandy generation. <laughs> I've got most of those. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to. If I've gone back, collected ones that I had or borrowed. Mm. Um, interestingly, rubbish. Because I, <laughs> uh, I remember them with great affection. Mm -hmm. Going back, they you know, poorly explain it, take a lot for granted. It's amazing what they don't do. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, having said that, you know, it doesn't happen. Um, so, um, yeah, so World War II, and then subsequently Ancient. I think mm -hmm. that's, you know, that kind of love of Ben Hur and the, all those kind of epic films, Baltica, and that kind of gets in your blood. And, I, and I'm from Lincoln, which is um, a big old Roman. Quite a few. Um, when we were school kids, we'd be dragged around a lot of, a lot of the um, uh, Roman remains. There's actually a, uh, an arch in Lincoln which was part of the Roman defences. There was traffic still goes under it. Mm. Occasionally gets stuck. <laughs> There's also a big wall down by the council building. Oh, right. Is that right? A big Roman wall. Uh, okay. What is it? Uh, for me, I guess we well, achieved it with not history, is it? Space, space battles. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, actually, as well, I think one, one because I studied classics at school, uh, high school, so I think a Iliad game going in really into mm -hmm. that with all the heroes, naming them, mm -hmm. giving them different mm -hmm. stats, making them like the heroes leading, leading the fight, that kind mm -hmm. of. Yeah, we've fought so often on something along those lines. Mm. Other people have done I, I think that's the problem. It's in, in trying to find a niche in which to kind of develop a little uh, things like this game group or culture or following, people have pretty much mined out everything. Mm. It's mm. very hard to find something that is still open. Yeah. yeah. It's impossible, right? It's, it's almost impossible. There's a few things. I'm not keen on modern. I'm not overly keen on modern warfare because there's a little, I find it a little bit too close, a bit close, yeah. 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 Although I know some of you, some of you here will play, will play it. Um, even World War II actually. Is at the edge? Yeah, it's on the edge. It's on the edge. I think it's because I have relatives who, well, not very close relatives, but I have relatives who served in the war. My parents grew up during the war. And, you know, it's, I, when I read about World War II, I tend to, I tend to go away from the individual combat and start reading about the logistics, the, um, the, you know, the, the economics of it. I don't know, I just get drawn into that. Whereas John Stallard, he's, he's very much in the way he gets drawn into the individual combat and the memoir. So to him, it's much more of a sort of personal experience. Um, uh, and, I, and I came to this and go, mm -hmm. 60,000 people, mm -hmm. that's a lot of people killed with one bomb. Mm. Is that why there's no. World War One version of bolt action because it was so close. A bit grim. Yeah, um, it's a bit grim. As in, because I'm visiting uh, battlefields and stuff. That's a bit. The, the real reason is because um, it would be a lot of effort. Yeah, yeah um, can you really do a 28 mil first world war? Yeah. Yeah, well, you could, but you'd have to put so much resources into it to make all the models. Mm. You should be, you, you, it's as big as World War Two in terms of the mm. Great War. Sorry? The Sword of the for Great War. Yeah, we did Great War for um, uh, Warhammer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Great War game. Um, yeah, so it's not, it's, it's not technically impossible, it's just a huge investment. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, particularly when you have a World War II game that I think, yeah, that maybe you try something different like Antares. Yeah. 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 And the interesting bits of World War One 
Also, more like World War Two, you've got the war in the um, Near East, which is more mobile. Yeah, you suddenly wouldn't focus on trench warfare. That, that doesn't make a good game. <laughs> you <laughs> you, you, you yeah. think battles with movement and yeah. small, small, small like. trees. <laughs> Very victory. On that much territory. <laughs> not entirely oh. true. <laughs> no, it's not. On the naval games at sea, you do. I mean, yeah. Well, I'm amazed to say you do great. Uh, the whole series of great games for naval warfare. Yeah. The only thing that's missing is back into the ancients triremes. Yes, again, that that's that's one of the few things that um, I, I would have uh, liked to have a go at actually. Yes. Um, and I did actually design a. Um, Kind of um, the outline for a game using triremes about that big, um, and I actually bought a few. Did you write the Rod Lang yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love you. Yeah, 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 I've got I've got a few of those. Gosh, they're hard work putting them together. Oh, yes. they? Yeah. <laughs> With a little um, brass etched uh, yeah. board. Mm. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Yeah. The Triremes was a yeah. long heel mm. board, board game. Uh, called Trireme. Oh, there is, yeah. yeah. Which I, I, I played it, I owned it when I was younger. It's hard. <laughs> it's not a simple game. Well, but it's, it's only got its um, offset rectangle that all makes it, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, it, it was that. There was also Dorian G did a set of um, Navy Rules by Richard yeah. Nelson. And I played that a lot. It was the only um, It was the only game I could beat my mate Richard Halliwell. Richard Halliwell and I grew up together and we played all of this together. He died recently. You might oh, know. Did he? Um, well, but, uh, yeah, he, he's the co-author of Warhammer, the original yeah. Warhammer. Uh, uh, he, he, he was one of these guys who could look at set rules and immediately go, yeah, okay, this is this. And then you'd play him and you'd, be, you'd just feel like you'd be slapped around the face all the time. And he, he, he was he'd very cute, he understood how rules work. But he couldn't play that naval game. Every time I beat him, it's the only thing I could beat him at. So he was to say, stop playing it quite quickly. It's very sad to lose Richard, actually. I don't know how many of you know know of him. He worked um, with Games Workshop for a good while. He did uh, Space Week, was his main uh, big game. Yeah. 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 Well, same thing. I could, I could let you get back to pilfering the. Uh, the uh, <laughs> so, uh, well, I think, uh, um, to both of you, actually, um, what's the fav your favourite rule set you've written? Do you want to go first? Uh, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's, it's a children. Yeah. My children. Yeah. yeah. It's simply, I would say, what's that? Babies. <laughs> it seems a bit funny, but let's say Bolt Action, because I, I can't just, between Lord of the Rings and Bolt Action, I think. But yeah. Bolt Action. Be, Funny enough, we worked together on both of those. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, I think the answer is probably the only war game that I still play for fun as opposed to for work <laughs> is Bolt Action. Mm. I really enjoy going to events. I used to go to events <laughs> before COVID, mm. uh, or to tournaments and stuff, and uh, hopefully a game. But yeah, that's the one I enjoy to play for recreation, not for, not for business, which is, I guess, the answer, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. I can't say Bolt Action because really it's your game. <laughs> And uh, which means that actually everything derived from that, which is Antares and Erewhon, which are the two I've kind of done with all of the science fiction and fantasy games, they're, they're really reiterations of the Bolt Action system. It's funny. It's yeah. my only career copying your rules and making no, an edition of Warhammer. <laughs> 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 Warhammer 7th edition. Yeah, at least you've got authority. Yeah, it's on me. <laughs> <laughs> Standing on the shoulders of Jack. Yeah, there you go. Um, and uh, so I'm trying to think, really. I mean, I th again, Warhammer is a strange one for me because although um, I, I, I just sat down and wrote most of the versions of Warhammer, most versions of 40k up until the 80s, um, they were all collaborative efforts, weren't they? Uh, so I was, I was very, I was very pleased and proud with the Warhammer um, Fourth Edition, which I know destroyed the life of many people. <laughs> But yeah. it relaunched the game. It changed it. It changed it totally. I think what people don't appreciate is that commercially it was dead at that point. It really was. And uh, the Games Workshop had just been sold. So uh, we'd gone from having quite a lot of money and a rather indulgent boss, Brian Ansel, who was interested in games and was prepared to put money behind uh, with this realm of chaos. Um, <laughs> 
to someone who we owe money, well, basically, the bulk of the company now owe venture capitalists 10 to 15 million pounds. Um, and we had to radically change the way the business operated. And that game enabled us to do it. Right, what, what year was that? 1991, 92, 92 mm. version of War. I usually mm. refer to them by date. So, the, mm. what's four, most people call it fourth edition. 1992, and most people refer to the fifth edition, the one after 1996. Right, me and him basically started on yeah. that fourth edition. That's well, that's the top. Uh, it, it, how old would you have been at the time? Oh, about 10. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it was a good edition to get into, and it was the fact that you were only 10 could get into it actually, I think, says a lot about that game. Because the third edition was by the previous version, by then, it was a hardback book, 1987. I think. Mm. That was it had become really sclerotic. Mm. You know, the rules were very odd. Well. People are very nostalgic about it because the book's fantastic. Anyone who remembers the big yellow mm. And the book is fantastic. And we spent loads of money on it. And colour, photography, and print at a time when that was hard work. I mean, none of this digital nonsense. You know, everything had to be hand carved out of wood. Which <laughs> 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 was the case. And um, uh, it was a beautiful book. Uh, people remember it very fondly. But the rules, the rules are almost so opaque and complicated. Yeah. And I think it's one of those things that people remember the warm glow and don't remember the detail of it. Because it's almost unplayable. Especially when you only have 50 goblins, right, on single bases, because they're all on single bases, because that's how we sell them, which is in a big block, and it gets pushed back three inches by unit of elves. <laughs> Next round, it gets pushed back another inch. You, could, you spend all day moving. <laughs> it was just hard work. Um, I also happen to know that uh, a good section of the uh, combat resolution rules ended up on the cutting room floor because everything was stuck down, pasted down onto big white boards and then sent to the printer. And um, you, you find this bit of paper on the floor. That's the section you should, oh my God. And it, it never got printed. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, was like, it was like the old rogue trading game where you, where, where you never had to read close comments to read through every year and shot each other. Yeah. <laughs> it was too complicated to read each other. He's funny, isn't it? Um, I'd say the first edition was Warhammer, the start of Warhammer for me as well. And uh, I remember so fondly that set of rules, the black and white art, the. The vibe, the atmosphere that yeah. created. It was that. The, it was that atmosphere that. Was or you couldn't afford the colour. plates. Colour plates four times as expensive, and because uh, there's four different colours, um, and uh, you have to do it. It's easy. At, at that time of day, you couldn't just insert colour randomly. Mm. You had to be within a sixteen-page section. Print is done in a big sixteen-page section like that. Massive, it's all then it's cut up. Um, and uh, you then have to work out exactly where those pages are going to fall when you put the colour in. And if you make that mistake, that would be expensive. Um, and that's why in those later books, they're all black and white. In the 1990s ones, they're all black and white. I think 1996, they started to do some colour again. Um, I remember I got into trouble with the cost of them. Yes, black and white has its own feel. There's different kind of feel, feel isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. And some I fantastic black and white art in the road trade book. And how long it takes from start thinking about uh, new rules to actually make uh, a new set on printed? I mean, it's just well, how long know. it will take to put the fifth edition of Warhammer on? Fifth edition of Warhammer, I can tell you exactly because we knew we were going to do it in 1991 because I proposed we were going to do it. By this time, we the company had been sold and uh, it was bought by the management by in theory. In practice, it was bought by a chap called Tom Cooley. Uh, so we had to have a new game for that September, which was going to be Warhammer 1992. Warhammer. Um, so I, I started designing it over the Christmas holidays 1991, December 1991. Uh, black sheet paper, uh, and I pushed the soldiers around on my floor at home and made notes on paper, 
and then in the January, I started writing that game and briefed everyone. And we had to start doing the plastic figures uh, pretty much there and then immediately. So we had to decide what plastics to do, hmm. because that's the longest lead time. Um, we had to get all the plastics ready for Easter, so for um, uh, April, so. Uh, which is quite, which is fast. Yeah, what month? Is that? January. That's the Sounds impossible. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's how fast we were. Oh. And the same, and I and I redesigned that game, get the rough roughed it out over Christmas, and then everything else had to be done pretty much. Well, we had to start doing the repro around the beginning of summer, June. So what I did that's why it's three books in the box. Yeah. Because I could get one book finished off repro, start the next one, get off the repro. In those days, there's a whole repro graphic process between um, you doing physical paste up and the print. That's pretty sad. We had that in sale for September, so nine months in that case, including nine months. Yeah. Uh, well, I sorted it. Yeah, no. no. So, um, I mean, we knew what Warhammer was, so we didn't have to conceptually reimagine it. Mm. But I still had to write up all the background, uh, redefine um, the races and everything. Um, so I guess I did use quite a bit of what was already there. Um, but the rules were kind of reformulated. Yeah, we say in general, it was a very broad asset. A year, so doing things, I would say at, at least a year, uh, but nine months. Yeah. Well, <laughs> including plastics. Yeah. Plastics are the. And it was a big tool we did for that as well. It might have been a 32 impression tool. That was a monster. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. so that's about as quick as you can do a big game. Um, these days, because you can go direct to print, you could probably knock out, if you knew what you wanted and really sort of belted it out and didn't fuss too much about playtesting. Playtesting will take as long as you like. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> if you want it to be perfect, good luck. You know it comes yeah. out. <laughs> you know it come out. And that's the problem. A lot of game design books look perfect and, and they get kind of over you can override it. And all that happens then is you move all the uncertainty and the doubt and the vagaries onto a higher, more legalistic level. You never get rid of them. They just become more and more erudite. Right? Yeah, and I think the difference is these days. At that time, you would be in a closed environment. You would yeah. be you with your team, etc. And, and that would be where the development happens. These days, because of the community and the internet, if you want, I mean, you want to listen to the community. But if you listen too much to the community, it's mm -hmm. hell. It's, it's hell because obviously yeah. people have different know, opinions, and tastes, <laughs> and they just go, "I like it black. I like it white. I like it grey. I like it." And you go. Ah, you cannot <laughs> literally. It, not only do you fail to please everybody, but you actually piss off people. Pretty much <laughs> everybody. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's quite weird. Yeah. Uh, so if you, do, if you don't overdo the playtesting, you know, you're know you confident in what you're doing, and you have to say a small group of people, which is what I prefer. I usually work with one or two mates on a project. Um, and I know them quite well, so I know their foibles and their idiosyncrasies. They say, oh, no, this is this is far too powerful. But you know you've got it back right. Yeah, tend to stick to it. Volt action. Yeah. You always go back to volt action, I think. That's it. Well, in terms of volt action, the thing I'm allowed to talk about really is um, uh, combined arms. I think, but you guys have heard about combined arms. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Maybe don't worry, your secret is I'm pretty sure I know. Uh, yeah, basically, we uh, we worked recently uh, for Warlord in designing a uh, campaign system, a bit like um, Mighty Empires. Using your rules. Recently, last year, we played this in your office at. Uh, yeah, Lake. but before the world stopped, let's say. Yes, yeah, yes. Okay. Before mm -hmm. the world two years ground ago. to a halt, but yes, we were working on this. Um, uh, campaign system. And the idea is allows you to. I don't know if you're familiar with Mike Empires, which was a yeah, big yeah, campaign, yeah. Warhammer, big scale thing. So going from strategy to, to tactical level. Um, basically, you have a what is a board game, 
we designed a board game with little toy soldiers, little ships, little, little planes, and factories and things, and uh, a map, a uh, kind of half generic map. Uh, basically, you build, play, you can play it as a board game, the gray faction against the green faction, if you want, or you can, the, the, entire, the opposite would be, you know, assign uh, point values to every counter and then resolve battles instead of using the, the board game system. You, you, you resolve them with. The interesting thing is that you can use bolt action for the land battles, you can use cross seas and uh, black red skies and resolve all those kind of engagements. You can go in as much detail as you like, really, and you can take as long as you want. I guess if you have a place where you can leave it set up and stay there. So the, the idea is to do a campaign system or a board game or a bit of both, depending on how much time and what mm -hmm. you want to do with it. Yeah, we play it as a board game, really, because we try to understand <coughs> the, the, the underlying mechanics of it. Yeah, if it works as a board game, then attaching the, 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 the rules is like a separate task. You know, it's like two terms of that. I think that's the trouble with those kind of campaigns, is that the, the campaign elements sometimes take over from the, war, uh, the actual war game elements. So you start to play it as a board game. I think that's the that thing about Monty Empire. It often ended up as being a, people would play it to a point, there'd be a battle and they go, oh no, we just want to continue to find out what happens next. <laughs> That's it, it was a good board game, right? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but when we play uh, campaign comparative, there's never any sense to that, is there? Well, those are, yeah, they're not designed to be played. Oh, no, that really is a problem with the game, isn't it? It's yeah, a, yeah. The they're Empire. always done on the map. They're always done on the map, and you move from village town to town. So there's never any. Never any really. I would say there's not a lot of maneuver. The maneuver tends to be desperately trying to avoid any armies that are twice the size you are, mm -hmm. failing miserably. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that is more like a role play campaign, really. Mm -hmm. it, 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 there's no rules, really. It's literally Alan deciding, yes, you saw some, your scouts spot some cavalry on, on the ridge, and they run away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> Yeah, and what for any more? Yeah, come back. Uh, elephant in room, I suppose. Is there any uh, bolt action version 3? Do you know, I was wondering that. Third edition. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <coughs> no one's mentioned it to me, but Overcast just is, is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
So they've got laser guidance, they've got much stronger, bigger tanks and everything. And they, they invade. And the premise and the background of how they get to that all actually makes sense. Right. They, they work on a different timeline to us. So when they first investigated Earth, we were riding around on horses, hitting each other with lumps of metal. Mm -hmm. They had the technology then that they had when they invent, invade us 500 years later. Right. And it's, you see it from both sides, and it makes for a terrific fun game. I yeah. take um, things like uh, Abrams and Bradleys to represent the aliens, and paint them up in weird colours. And then lizard men, they are actually lizard men in yeah. the game. So sci-fi lizard men to make up the, uh, oh, right. the other side. The bolt action is the core set of rules. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Just, uh, just adapt it to, to bolt action. It's great fun. Yeah. If you want to talk more about it, obviously I'll give you some the background. <laughs> but it's, uh, as I say, it's, it's different and it sort of links Second World War and, yeah. and uh, sci-fi together. Are you playing at a club level? Or you, uh, a... Just with, I'm in a club yeah. over in Hertfordshire. But um, yeah, uh, I've played there a couple of times with them, but usually it's kind of mate round. Yeah. Oh, let's have a go at that, something silly. Yeah. Because it is. Well, that's a nice <laughs> project, isn't it? Because mm. it's sort of capsular. That's right. Uh, and you can uh, you can each um, kind of indulge yourselves one way or the other and play sort of forces in it. And I guess you, your bolt action stuff also is usable in that context. Absolutely. So, yeah, and uh, I mean, for example, he, what something that's very clever about the way he does it is he ties in historical characters yeah. actually into the storyline. So the main characters are nobody knows about really. It's just their story, but they will meet historical characters. Yeah. And one lovely sequence is Otto Skorzene yeah. with the um, uh, he's, he goes out to steal a laser guidance system because obviously humans we will adapt, we will take and we will adapt and we will improve whereas the aliens have never changed they've been like this for thousands of years at the same level of development uh, so he goes out to actually um, basically steal a, uh, a laser guidance system comes back with an entire tank yeah, <laughs> well, quite credible. He was that sort of guy. He was very much so, exactly. But as I say, if you haven't seen it, the first one's called World War in the Balance, and uh, they're good fun. I, I have heard the name, mm. but I've not read any of it. He did a bit of a fair bit of uh, fantasy stuff as well. Yeah, that's probably where. I've yeah, heard that's possibly yeah. where you heard of him. Yeah, yeah. but uh, he's yeah. a name. He's in the cover. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't read a lot of SA. I sometimes go back and read older SA. Um, but mm. uh, um, yeah, my, my, my friend uh, Tim Bancroft, he reads a lot of SA and sometimes okay. recommends things. Well, I, 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 about five years ago, I had this conversation in a pub with some gaming mates and said, There's, there's no decent British sci fi coming out anymore. There's nothing really good. And they told me the name Peter F. Hamilton. Right. And his stuff is superb. Is he British? British, yeah. British it's writer. mostly American. He, he, yeah. Especially the military genre. Okay. Yeah. It does tend to be American. Mm. Um, and the, I think the market for SF in America is is much, much bigger. Yeah. And it tends to be, um, I would say, Vietnam space, but it tends to have that kind mm. of uh, uh, military feel to it. Yeah. Actually, it prompted a second question, so I might be really greedy here. I'll, I'll start with the second one first, because you just mentioned the US interest. Is there any thought about taking uh, uh, bolt action beyond Korea into Vietnam, into Middle East uh, conflicts, later conflicts as well? Oh, John's done loads of stuff on the Indian Pakistan war, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know whether that's going to be published or just this thing. It's just a kind of a pet project. But I again, it, 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 it falls into the field of when it's too close, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like. Yeah. As yeah. far as I know, no. To be asked, I may be wrong. I mean, would you see it as a system that could be adapted to, to laser weapon systems, different uh, what guerrilla warfare things like that as well? I mean, you've got partisans in the world. Yeah. It works. It works well as a certain size, doesn't it? Uh, which is what you mean from we have we have an ominous positive, but um, it doesn't it doesn't scale down brilliantly well. I would think yeah like helicopters would be challenging and yeah. we did a bit of that in the, the Korean supplement like so we kept them a bit abstract because 
Yeah, helicopters are kind of at that moment where you go, is this like an abstract thing, like an airstrike or mm -hmm. artillery, or, yeah. or is it a thing on the table? And uh, that's the bit where you kind of go. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I understand that. I mean, uh, as I mentioned, I used chain of command and adapted that to Vietnam. <laughs> Um, uh, but my background is helicopter pilot, so I, I adapted it, and you're absolutely right, because of the, the, the completely different rates of movement and the fact that you can't pause <laughs> mid-air. But there are ways around it, uh, so um, um, it would be an interesting excursion for, for if, if you ever consider it. I guess a lot of people have probably adapted it for their own uses into late oh, yeah, well, perhaps yeah. haven't published it and that sort of thing. Yeah. But I have my second one, you did allude to this, you talked about scaling up. And obviously, black powder has gone epic, although I always played it at that sort of scale. Um, but is there any again? Do you think the, the uh, black powder, sorry, um, uh, bolt action could be escalated? Because there does seem to be a lack of a good sort of brigade division second war. Under yes. There's no lack of them, but there's nothing in the war lord um, uh, inventory. And you, I think you've got 28 mil, don't you? You think you've a small scale? Well, I mean, again, I mean, it's, for the black powder experience, is the drop down to um, the epic scale was, it was obviously an interesting move. And he thought about doing that in other scales. But you can use 28 in, to, to represent bigger battles. You know, a, a tank is not a tank, it's a platoon or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, many games work on that assumption, don't they? Yeah. Um, so I, I heard the conversation, yes, whether that's actually going to turn into a product, I don't think, uh, no, we, we know yet, but mm -hmm. it's a big conversation happens, so, you know, that's a niche in the market, like you say, that is potentially, potentially a thing. Yeah, I was a bit surprised that John championed that CFP. Yeah. Um, I think the notion was 15 mil, mm. but they're actually, I, I, I think the actual size is 15 mil if you measure them. Yeah. It's just that people don't describe 15 mil. When people say 15 mil these days, they usually mean 80 or 20. Yeah. Um, I think John always had that idea in his head, and I think it was sort of something he carried over from uh, mm -hmm. Warmaster. Yeah, no, I mean, I approve the move, and it's a shame it came for me yeah. several years too late. So I was yeah. playing Black Battle with 6 mil. Oh, okay. Just 40% you know, change yeah. of figure and things, and it works extremely well. Um, yeah. Because you know. can really do bigger actions. And, Still the same the place. Place. There's already a lot of very successful companies doing that. I mean, so I'm just going to roll this battle line with the team Yankee and Flames of War. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it flames of War. Yeah. Um, 15 now. I, I, I've got quite a lot of 15 mil figures. Mm -hmm. I actually started collecting 15 mil figures when Skytrex did, did, did a big rain. Um, and um, before, before Flames of War existed. Um, and John Snow did the same. And we actually cobbled together a set of World War II rules to play 15 mil. Um, and when, when we did one forty k third edition, uh, I used that set of rules as a basis for it. So uh, that was a good changeover. Uh, so, so we have done it. Um, the thing I find difficult about 15 mil and 10 mil on small scale is if you if your rules are focused on weapons and it matters whether the guy's got a submachine gun or a pistol or a assault rifle or a rifle or for that matter even a light machine gun. I look at my head, I can't see that scale. But we warm my stuff together in the beginning. Another mm. project we worked on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was work. It's a good game. But yeah. But again, because it works on that scale, there are rules for weapons. You just give a you have a stack. And, um, and you know, you, you, the game I think has to reflect the Yeah. Uh, there's a I just put a very funny story about uh, what we did uh, uh Roadmaster. Uh, basically Eric brought the core rules and I was brought in the project to help with the development play testing and uh, so you gave me the task of writing the analyst. So I go, okay, yeah, I'll sometimes I write all the arms. And uh, but then we had to play test and uh, you were like, okay, can you make some arms, etc. And I was like, sure. And basically, like a couple of days later, I to go, I have the full range of armies all ready to play test everything. And it was just like, and you're like, what did you do? She must have stayed all night updating each other. 
So what I did, I, I made it a very bargain. I, I printed the, the bases at the right size with the stats written on things. So the other all blue rectangles with uh, with the stats on it for play testing, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. It's a war game. You need, you know, a bit of, <laughs> put some features on this thing. So, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it, was exactly. it was completely about maths. It was like, but it was like yellow, the yeah. other blue. <laughs> you can, you can get quite a way doing that. Obviously, we, we kind of do. Uh, but the original game was written for um, uh, six mil, eight mil. We wouldn't call that big at the time, but. Um, the figures were quite small, and uh, I think John Stallard came along with some 10 mil figures he found. He said, Well, how to make them like this? Yeah. We ended up making them a little bit bigger. Yeah. But um, still, you know, the study cop really tell you what you do things for. Well. There we go. Yeah. I heard a lot of the early games workshop rule sets had a lot of granular detail in them. Yeah. Like, I remember in. 40k moving a mace tape template round on a on a diagram of a rhino to work yeah. out where it's going to hit things like that. Obviously, like modern war games, a lot of that has been sacrificed to the to making things more streamlined. But do you think there is room for that kind of granular detail in war games today, or will we never see that sort of thing again? I won't say never say again because the, I think the um, Atari game system I did has got a lot of granular detail, oh. a lot too much maybe. And um, Tim has actually written a. Um, Kind of a kill team version of it, it uses single figures of units, which has even more value in the detail. <laughs> uh, and I'm reading through the rules at the moment, I think, oh, this is complicated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's basically the same game. Um, so, yeah, it's got a lot in it. I'm not sure how much, how much commercial potential is that. I think people don't have the patience for it anymore. I think those of us who are getting on a bit don't quite have the yeah. Um, yeah. focus that perhaps we want to have <laughs> with teenagers. And um, the youngsters are really kind of like, oh, try this, I'll try that. It doesn't seem like they've got that same kind of. Uh, yeah, so that, that level, the level of complexity these days, maybe you give it to a computer and so on, it was all to handle rather than uh, you know having to physically go through all of that. So there is a little bit of that, I guess, and uh, different type of game. I mean, I, I, I tend to sit firmly in the opposite camp of I, I try to. Chop things down to, to, to oh, yeah. tiny, tiny, mm -hmm. tiny little things. That, but I guess I, I can see that for a game. But as long as you have like three, four, five things on the table that you control, you know, inquisitor, you know, like mm -hmm. you have yeah. very few things, then yes, I can see that. You know, the locations, hits, and stuff, you know, different parts of armor. And, but yeah, when you have an army, I, I, I wouldn't have it. But yeah, that's yeah. personal things. Yeah. Uh, the background in Irish as well, you tend to end up with lots and lots of modifiers for things. Yes. So you want the detail, mm -hmm. so you put the detail in with the modifier. But the minute you get more than six modifiers, you can never remember how many there are. So there's a sort of golden rule is that you just have six modifiers. You can sometimes go, well, behind cover is a plus one or a plus two. Yeah. You know, and that's maybe more. Yeah. But then you can use, uh, I mean, everyone has a tablet or a mobile phone that can help you to get through all these details? I don't know. I, I, well, I don't does it take a full uh, I don't know. It's just, just thinking that Wait, you, can, you, can, you can have nah. the, the details on, of all your tanks, how are slightly damaged, yeah. how this turret is just wear off or just stuck, or, and then have this little there. Instead of having to calculate your by yourself, I don't it's, know. It's all about what it's fun, I think, isn't it? Mm. Uh, and for me, actually, moving that little template round on a diagram from Rhino, that was fun because you feel like you're the yeah. guy about to launch a missile at it or something like that. That was but, the idea. Yeah, yeah which is, and I really enjoyed that. Yeah. It was a little, yeah, yeah, little viewfinder thing diagram, yeah. was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoyed that. But then I could see, like, for a tournament gamer, that's a pain in the butt because you're, you're, you're there in the tournament and you've got a time scale to play a game by, and that's the do you think like tournament gaming is driving rule set development much more than narrative gaming is? Well, yeah, because uh, tournament, tournament players tend to <coughs> they hate random. They like calculation. Yeah. So if they can calculate that something will work a certain way, then they're happy. But a lot of the character and fun out of the game comes from things just being quite random yeah. or mm. less easy to control. Yeah. Um, and 
So you tend to, if you, if you go strongly in terms of, oh, this is going to be a competition game, you tend to remove a lot of the character, a lot of what makes the game fun in the first part. So I don't know, uh, I thought the fun was about crushing your enemies and destroying them before you listen to them. Yeah, we have a scream. That's room for advice, good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. 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 I think it's, there, are, there are games which are very tournament focused or very get together focused. Mm. I think um, something like DPA, you know, the Georgie game, the Phil Bolton game, DPA, um, which is a 12 element game. And quite abstract. That was designed to be played cheerfully in a you know in the pub after a main event, but it's become a sort of little hobby in its own right. Mm. And the people who play that game, they, they love it. Mm. And I look at it and they go, "What's the point in that? There's only twelve elements." <laughs> you know, it, it's, and it's very um, all Phil Barker's games tend to be very geometric. Mm. So it matters whether that's ninety degrees or ninety one degrees. It matters whether that's sixty millimeters or sixty one. They're very precise like that. Mm. And I tend to do the opposite mm. because I know how people actually measure and what happens in the real world. <laughs> so uh, I think the less the lesser games reliant upon that kind of precision, yeah. the stronger it will be, the stronger base you've got, more flexibility. Mm. Yeah, I liken it to um rules can be very br- I, I, I said brittle. If rules are very brittle, it means you know, you're a millimetre out and they all falls apart. Mm. If they're very flexible, you go, yeah, it's better off. Um, and that, so I tend to go for that way. Yeah. You know, but that's mostly because that's what I enjoy. Yeah. And that's being a bit idle. Mm. Interesting enough, Games Workshop at one time produced their own tape measures. Um, it's like little plastic rules, or something. Yeah. We say yeah. certain on putting and everything. I hated it. The wicked six. Not me. Really the two reasons I hated it. What was that? It cost money. Yeah. And you go, well, that's mean, Rick. Really. Yeah, but for every one of those. Plastic rulers in there, we could put them in the toy soldiers in. And what would you remember all that? Hmm. Yeah, what well, I remember the red ruler thing was people were in that. So, that was a very good way <laughs> So, at my school, so at my school, we were like sword fighting with it and stuff like yeah. that. One lad got a bit too excited, yeah. tripped on his lace, and it went in between oh, his eye and his like wow. there. Oh, and wow. Our Warhammer club got banned for a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, the Marvel yeah. still got welts over the back. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I remember the Monster Day, you'd have still gone to workshop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we didn't get them all to school, was you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, originally, they were also in um, Hard Story. The original yeah. ones were in Hard Story. Yeah. And we found that they were a bit dangerous. <laughs> yeah. And so we had sure. them moulded instead in a softer plastic. But what they didn't say was that the plastic, mm-hmm. the, plastic <laughs> the coefficient of expansion was yeah. definitely these sorts yeah. of plastic. Yeah. So when was the, base, the basic one was five, when it came down 10 inches was 10 inches, the new one was five and a half inches. They had an elastic one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do we stretch? I played against people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> played hot weather with it. I always say. Go, go, buy a tape measure from the <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Well, store, it's very cheap. cheap. Yeah. The shop behind you. What's that? Well, buy a tape one. measure. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I, all the time at Games Workshop, it used to drive me mad that people have paid a fortune for these tape measures. And I was once asked to um, do a seminar, and they said, Rick, what's your best? Can you give us a tip? And I said, here's a tip. And I reached in my pocket, and I took out. B and Q tape measure, and the next point I took out a, I think it must have been an IKEA tape measure, and so on. And I piled all these tape measures up. And we went, so, never pay more than fifty p for a tape measure. You got you got the Martin that day. Right? They wouldn't let me do it. <laughs> Somebody mentioned um, about sort of the, um, uh, the potential use of, of, of uh, iPhones and the rest of it to support gaming. Mm. One of my particular bugbears, and I've never managed to get away from it, is you, you spend time painting an army and you're, you're very proud of it and you put together the best bit of terrain you can and it all looks beautiful, or you think it does. And then you end up with lots of little counters and, and yeah. strange other tokens following your army around, yeah. which rather loses the impact. Now, yeah, I know evil, evil things. Evil, evil things. I mean, what are your thoughts as designers about how you can get away with that? Experience? 
I, I don't like to see too much of that yeah. full stop. Uh, uh, and I think games which rely on that, or that's all, to me, that's a bit of a crutch. Mm. Um, I'm a bit of a pen, pen and pencil, so sometimes you know, it's been a problem how you can swallow people around. But and the, the Perry's are great for this, aren't they? Because we, we play a lot of games around the Perry's, and the Perry's have beautiful terrain, and they do not want to see it go deep. Right. So they make, um, where necessary, they make markers, mm -hmm. which are usually casualty markers, yeah. or little vignettes, mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, and they don't spoil the. Actually, occasionally we resort from the dice behind to leave them. Yeah. Yeah, we need to keep you know, track of them all as well. But, but from a designer's perspective, is that something you would you have in your mind as you as you yeah. produce yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. I, I really don't like to see too many markers. And I'm stuck between the war game crowd, the war game customer that likes the diorama, likes the, the, the look of things, which absolutely hates that. I really don't understand that. You, know, you want the Paris, you want the lying down soldier to be a casualty, so not a marker and bright thing. But on the other end, because I work a lot with board games as well, uh, the, the, the customers there would go completely opposite. They they love their, oh, why so you tell a unit you want a card on the table as well with all the stats, and then you want a marker here and this. And they, they, they actually, the feedback you get from there is com completely the opposite. So, because I tend to live yeah. a bit between those two worlds. And yeah. I, I, for example, that action, you go, well, yeah, it would be nice not to have every unit has a <coughs> marker and dice next to it to show activation. And, and the pin markers, but you know, go, uh, but the, the core of the game works with that. So minimizing the looks. I mean, the, I've seen the people making our know, little, uh, I don't know, rifles in the second round with, uh, with, with the with the with the pin markers, yeah. and so on, etc. So uh, you can try to make it less. And certainly, I don't want it to grow on both yeah. actions. So no, if we can reduce it, I don't think we can without changing the game. You, right? you still need states, don't you? You need that kind of, is this unit routing? Is this unit disordered? Is this mm -hmm. unit um, you know, wounded, whatever? Oh, I took care of that. <laughs> <laughs> if, 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 it's, if it's fighting is there, if it's routing, retreating, it's not on the table. It's not on the table. You never have units routed. You have You're there in the yeah. So I've been to a couple of war games clubs and stuff. And what the, there's one chap who did and I loved it. He made little data cards for each of his unit. Yeah. Had it on this. He didn't put any markers or anything like that next to the unit. He yeah, put it on his data well, cards as well instead. So yeah. I don't know if that would be I, an idea. I, I, it's a it's a great idea. I must have tried every single variety of, yeah. of ways of, of that compromise between you want the information instantly available as you look at it. You don't want to be going back and forth and saying that's the that's the third loan shoes. And they've taken 14 casualties and they're, and they're out of brain gun ammunition or whatever. They've got, you would like the, the information visually there, but that interferes. So, with little markers off. Yeah, little data cards or something cards like that, that, yeah. So long as you can easily relate it yeah. to what's on the table. Yeah. Well, I think again, where you've got a game that's got a lot of granularity, where you want to track ammunition or yeah. wounds or exhaustion or something like that, that's useful. Mm -hmm. I would say in that case, you could go, well, could that be on a computer? Could that be on your iPad? That's yeah. right. Um, it's an actual physical card, which is the best yeah. thing. But as I am of the anti-panic generation, yeah. um, <laughs> I, I do have an iPad. Lord knows, I'd love to know how it works. 